to the front lines and into the unknown for all of us. Today is decision day. Students from across the country and the world must decide if they'll accept admission to the college of their choice. Today is May the 1st. Here in Northwest Tennessee, it is a beautiful day outside. Given spring type characteristics in the degree towards the sun shining, the grass is growing, the Bees are pollinating, the birds are flying, and the hummingbirds from down in South America has now made it up this far north. Please listen to this program pertaining to colleges making decisions today. Today is a big day, a decision day for a lot of your schools all over the U.S. Please listen. But many are completely torn. Will their college reopen? Is it worth it to pay for online classes? Rahima Ellis is at Columbia University in New York City. Rahima, the American Council on Education says schools should expect enrollment to be, la to be down at least 15% across the board. What kind of impact is that going to have on schools across the country? It could be tremendous because it's 15% for U.S. students, some, something like 25% drop in enrollment for foreign students. They're saying that could be upwards of $23 billion in terms of a loss of revenue, but some other reports are pushing that number as high as $45 billion decline in revenue because of a lack of tuition, money from room and board, and other fees. For those colleges that were already teetering on the edge of existence, this could be the kind of thing that just pushes them right over the edge. Also, for historically black colleges that often operate on a very thin margin, this could be very devastating for them as well. Even those colleges that say that they're going to come back, as you point out, Stephanie, this campus and others across the country are probably not going to look like normal come the fall. And parents are going to have to ask the question of if there is more online or learning as opposed to campus, should they even send their students here? Big questions to be asked, and nobody has the answers just yet. Stephanie? Rahima, thank you so much. Joining us now, someone who's trying to answer those questions, president of Arizona State University, Michael Crow. President Crow, you just announced ASU will reopen in the fall. You've got more than 50,000 undergrad students across your campuses. How do you keep dorms, classrooms, cafeterias, and even your own faculty safe? And that's not even getting into off-campus activities, which you don't control. Well, the key, what we're doing is we're, thank you, Stephanie, the key is we're, we're, we're planning to be adaptive. We're planning to adjust. We're, we're operating under the assumption that we have to find ways for the country to move forward, for life to move forward. And to do that, it means uh, probably new normals, new ways of doing things, new ways of engaging. Uh, we've got a lot of experience uh, out here with this semester right now. And so we're just looking to uh, do everything we can to keep everything moving forward. But for parents making that decision today, they need more specifics than just new. College uh, is a huge undertaking and a huge expense. What will the protocol be? When one student gets sick, what happens next? So we've had uh, students test positive this semester. We've uh, worked through uh, expansion of testing, expansion of uh, of uh, uh, isolation and tracing. And so so we, we none of us know where this thing will be. Uh, by the fall and so what we've said is that we're planning to be able to work and to operate to create a learning environment which is uh, dynamically engaged with whatever we're dealing with in terms of the biological reality of corona four-year colleges could face up to 20 percent decline in fall enrollment is your enrollment down at this point and what could a number like that mean to a school like yours Well, we're already a transformed institution just from the last six weeks. We now have three modalities of operating. We have full immersion on campus. We have full immersion synchronous engagement through uh, a technology like the one you and I are using right now. And then we have digital uh, immersion through an asynchronous technology called online. Uh, right now, uh, our enrollment numbers for online are accelerating positive. 
and we believe that our enrollment numbers will be uh, stable going forward for most categories of activity. We don't know about international students because of uh, these issues, travel complexities we're not aware of yet. Uh, we are concerned about enrollment shifts, uh, and so therefore we're now reacting in a way where we can engage students uh, here or wherever they are with the totality of everything that we have. That's our approach, full engagement. Can't play football on a Zoom call. College sports are more than just a game. It's an integral part of uh, big time college sports, uh, college finances. What are your plans or what are your thoughts around football this fall and all college sports? So what we're looking at with our, with our program, we're a part of the Pac-12 conference with Stanford and UCLA and UC Berkeley schools like that, University of Washington. Uh, our plan is to look at every alternative, to listen to health department officials, and uh, you know perhaps the season uh, would be delayed, perhaps the season would be implemented in a different way, perhaps the season would be shrunk to just conference games. Every scenario imaginable is being thought through with uh, student safety and health and well-being being our principal objective here. And before we go, what is your message to all those families, those high school seniors making the decision today? My message is, uh, you know, basically roll with the uh, with the waves. I mean, uh, engage, find the college that you really love, engage with that college, connect with them. And this is going to work its way through. This is going to work its way uh, to a solution. And you may be engaged in in. Uh, some technology enhancement, uh, you may be engaged on campus, you may be engaged in some of both. Just keep your life moving forward and take the help that people are offering you. President Crow, thank you, good luck to you. I know you got a lot of work uh, cut out for you ahead. And to all those college seniors, I know this is an important day. I wanna say congratulations to you. I know this is hard, but it's also significant and it's an honor. Good for you. Your life's about to change in a good and exciting way. That wraps us up this hour. I'm Stephanie Rule. My dear friend and colleague, Eamon Mohadeen, picks up coverage on the other side. He'll be speaking with the president of the MTA. What's next? What's next? What's next? That was the question. To be or not to be is the question. What's next? In an unstable environment, in an unstable world, none of us know what's next. We would like to believe that we know what's next. We even bank, forecast, and stick our necks out towards what's next. But in reality, we really don't know what's next. Whenever you have an environment that's supposed to be a learning environment pertaining to life. And now basically the thing that most people have been learning is the skills and the trades of this world and the skills and the trades of becoming more wickeder and more sinfuler. That's whenever you have the breaks that will fall upon the humanity such as has fallen upon to humanity towards once more trying to bring a learning environment into society to where we as a society can understand these things. <clears throat> I'm going to turn my camera around real quick so that I can view myself to be able to capture this particular moment on May the 1st, 2020. We have reached a pivotal moment in society to the point that um, it's not only uncertain regarding our school systems, 
pertaining to what classroom or what school that we should try to enroll little Johnny or little Sally into. But we've reached a very, very pivotal moment in society to where the intellect needs to speak out towards where we are and what we're doing. One of those great admirers of my own, personally, has already come and gone into the world and is no longer with us pertaining to Billy Graham. You have to stop and ask yourself the question, though, if Billy Graham was still with us today during this pandemic, what would he have to say about what was going on in the world pertaining to him being an internationally known evangelist, pertaining to knowing the Bible and the very elements that I'm talking about right now pertaining to a teaching environment? You have to ask yourself other questions towards what if brother so-and-so down the road was still living? What if sister so-and-so down the road was still living? What if my mother, what if my father, what if the principal or the teacher that I was familiar with was still living? What would they have to say about this moment in time where we're living in? Just as of last night, I texted one of my neighbors. I'm not going to mention his name. That's within almost a rock throwing distance of, of my house. That has been one of the better type neighbors since I have moved back here in 2014 and him and his family has moved into this area. <clears throat> I expressed and explained to them the deep roots that my family had in this area going all the way back to the to the uh, to the 1800s leading into the early 1900s. How that my Great grandpappy was a predominant citizen in this area up until the 1929 depression fell. That basically he tried to tote a great deal of people around in this area. People that was hurting, people that needed credit, people that needed expense accounts to the point that it literally drove him and his family off into a state of bankruptcy. This particular individual that I'm talking about actually worked for We the People out of O'Brien County. He was a magistrate that went around as a judiator making decisions of who was guilty of what crime and what type of punishment that that crime deserved. That was considered not only ethical but legal at that time towards them doing what they was doing. And of course, in the involvement of World War I leading into World War II, our whole dynamics changed in the judicial system towards how that we didn't just have open court in a courthouse and basically hang somebody from, the, from a local tree somewhere based upon some sort of court of law. In other words, we was elevating as a society from being that type of people over to where we are today in our judicial system. But as the pinnacle has swayed too far once more to the left or to the right, trying to rebalance itself, we realize that we have got things out of order. And whenever things get out of order, that's whenever the Almighty steps in towards bringing his type of order into society. Is this something that God wants or finds favor in towards doing to humanity whenever humanity gets out of focus or gets out of balance this way? No, it is not. That's the reason why the Bible says that it is considered great grief or sorrows that fall upon to humanity during the time that we're in right now. 
but it's still a learning environment for those who are inquisitive and for those who have survival instincts in wanting to know why such things are occurring. <clears throat> the neighbor that I'm talking about that lives up the road, I explained to him that, you know, if I were to come back into this neighborhood towards offering all types of illegal stimulants pertaining to marijuana or pills, drugs, moonshine, alcohol, prostitution, being a whore, uh, uh, giving away sexual favors, they would have found me to be enticing and enlightening by me coming back into this area. But because I come back into this area wanting to help people and to free them from these bondages, the neighborhood turned against me. Just like the neighborhood turned against my grandpappy after they realized that what he was doing was considered unethical or immoral and they basically turned their back on my whole family in the early 1900s and left them holding the bag and the bag was empty. You would have thought from the 1900s leading to where we are now approximately a hundred years later that civilization would have learned their lessons. But one thing that I have looked at towards the characteristics of humanity that humanity carries the same type of characteristics as the generation before them and the generation before them and the generation before them. In other words, if you look at what happened during the era of Noah, whenever God gave Noah a message and Noah become the messenger, society by and large rejected that message. They didn't want to have nothing to do with that message that Noah was preaching. And because they didn't want to have nothing to do with that message, there was an alternative. It wasn't a good alternative, but there was an alternative. There was actually two alternatives. They could have listened to Noah and become obedient towards the messenger that was giving forth the message, or they could have chosen the latter of the alternatives. And that's what humanity done. They chose the latter of the alternatives. We see basically the same thing that happened to the pharaohs pertaining to how that God was demonstrating his power again and again and again in different waves or in different degrees. It started out in degree one, degree two, degree three, degree four, degree five, until finally God throwed the whammy on them pertaining to the angel of death that come down that killed the firstborn that rattled them, rattled the Pharaoh's heart. But the Pharaoh's heart was still hardened and it wasn't until the ocean swallowed up all of them and killed his army was whenever they realized that they had been defeated by Moses' God. Once more, God works in elements. He works in degrees. But the characteristics of that message was they was in denial they didn't want to support the messenger, and they paid the ultimate cost. The same thing with the messenger pertaining to Christ, Jesus Christ. We know, according to the history books 2,000 years ago, that if they would have listened to Jesus, first of all, they wouldn't have assassinated him. They would not have crucified him. They would have stood with him and supported him. And we also know that after the death of Christ, great horror and misery fell upon to the world in different areas in different ways. 
once more choosing the latter rather than the first. Today, I see similar characteristics in not just this neighborhood, but throughout the world, because today the windmill ministry still does not have supporters that supports its endeavors towards people knocking on my door or ringing and blowing up my phone. Which leads me to believe that humanity, once more, is choosing the latter. Even in the center and the middle of a pandemic. These are learning atmospheres that God has placed into our lives so that we can acknowledge why the Master upstairs, the Almighty, is doing what He is doing or allowing to be done what is being done. The more that I learn and I look at this experience of me being once more, uh, in a similar position as, as Noah, or Moses, or even Jesus Christ. Knowing that I'm not Jesus Christ, knowing that I'm not even worthy to loose the, the sandals that Jesus Christ walked into, pertaining to him being the only begotten, but being in the same position towards me being a messenger, are starting to scratch my head in identifying, wow, I'm seeing the exact same characteristics that started in the beginning of people being in denial. And as I have said to my neighbor, and I'll say to you, on this first day of May, 2020, from all indication, from what I can see, humanity, society, is choosing the latter versus supporting the, the messenger. I realize that people don't like the message. I realize, and so do they, that what has occurred here has been a travesty. But it is a travesty that can be reversed. There is that first ultimative before you get to the second ultimative. I personally feel like as a messenger that I have done my part by putting the message out there. And giving people full responsibility in doing what needs to be done. It wasn't but about a year and a half ago that God was moving up into my heart towards bringing great travesty, great remorse to this area as far as a major, major earthquake. And I backed away from that because I felt like that it would be too devastating for the communities to recover from. Whenever you're talking about roads and bridges, homes, cities, crumbling up on top of each other, you're talking about an area that sometimes takes a whole generation or two before they finally recover from that. And once more, if they don't realize what is occurring and why it's occurring, they're still going to be dumbfounded towards repeating the same thing again and again and again. Once more, the message will be, lesson will be repeated until learned. How are you going to know what's going on if you don't have a messenger or a teacher or an instructor such as myself that's trying to tell you what's going on here. Though people don't appreciate it, though a lot of them don't want to believe it, I'm still put in a position to where I have to put my message out to the general public. I can see now between the major droughts and the fires out west, even some out in eastern Tennessee, the floods the tornadoes, the hurricanes, what happened in Mount Karma, what happened in Oklahoma, what happened in New York City pertaining to 9-11. All these events have been short-lived. Short you know, people want to act like they're humbling or learning their lesson from that event 
but then a few weeks, a few months later, a few years later, they go right back to their old sinful nature way. Well, this pandemic that has now befallen upon the humanity is changing the strategy of a few things, but I'm still not seeing it change the strategy of the way we think, the way we treat each other, the way that we perform our duties towards God and our duties towards each other. Once more, if I did, I truly believe that this door right here would be swinging open more so than it stands shut. Obviously, I'm dealing with a group of people that is dim-witted, that have been bamboozled, that have been deceived, and they're still following after worldly manners more so than godly manners. So, I wash my hands of the events that's going to happen to humanity. And I'm just not talking about washing my hands with some hand stimulizer, but I'm talking about washing my hands from the horror and the sorrow and the misery that is going to be fallen from this moment on to humanity because it will come in one form or another coming near a neighborhood near you. You know, we're not but about 30 days from hurricane season. The waters out there in the Gulf are still exceptionally warm. We are still having transformation periods pertaining to the planet still warming up. But yet and all, we're seeing countries like China rev up their engines pertaining to their manufacturing, their smokestack industries, twice as hot, twice as long, twice as hard, because now they're trying to catch up in the products that they failed to make in the past 90 days. Wrong move. Wrong move. God has put the brakes upon to humanity for a reason. And I'm telling you now, if we don't wake up, in this learning environment and I'm not talking about elementary school I'm not talking about social studies and high school I'm not talking about colleges I'm talking about life the learning experiences of life and what we must do as a society if we're going to remain a society the lessons are not being learnt and are not being retrieved as they're supposed to be. And because of it, we will see more and more grief and more and more hardship that will fall upon to humanity until humanity decides that they're going to wake up and come out of this stupor that they have been in now for the past 30 plus years, beginning right up the road seven miles in a little town called Kenton, Tennessee. That was give or take about 35 years ago. Pertaining to the Damien Crosses and the Neils, and I could name off at least a dozen more names that was involved in that movement, that resistance movement towards wanting to mark or taint the very individual that's sitting in front of you right now giving you this message. Forgive me for not looking my best. I've just recently woke up. I haven't even finished my bowl of cereal yet that I'm eating. Okay? But I felt like that this message needed to be addressed. And it needed to be addressed in a severe way pertaining to we are not out of the woods pertaining to the COVID-19 coronavirus experience. Good luck all of us as we repeat from this ministry again and again and again in which we mean it sincerely especially those who are seeking a righteous divine life good luck to all of us and may God have mercy on all of us may God bless the America America and the Americans 
and those who are striving towards a righteous, better way of life, globally speaking, up onto this planet. Because I promise you, if it is written, written in the words of red, for it to occur, the Bible says, regardless of how many people dislike the message coming from the messenger, that it would have been easier for all of heaven and earth to pass than for one jot to fail. That all the gates of hell could not nor would not prevail against God's message coming from his messengers. Regardless whether, whether his messengers was Noah, Moses, Jesus, or Juby. This is not my message. This is God's message. Okay? And I'll not only tell my neighbor down the road here that I can throw a rock at and almost hit his house, but I'll tell all the neighborhood and all America and all the world the same message. That until we are willing to go back and do our first works over again, just like it talks about in the first four chapters of Revelations, we are going to see more and more severe things happen to not only the Americans here in America, but throughout the world. These are God's sorrows. And if we don't look upon to these sorrows as them being signs, what have we learned? In a learning environment. We haven't learned nothing. Because we're just like a dog returning back to its vomit. Though we're moving. We're moving. Okay. We're, we're, we're actually functuating. But we're just like a dog chasing after its tail. We're not going nowhere. We're not learning. We're not expanding. We're not growing. We're not evolving. We're not becoming better as a society and because we're not becoming better as a society God has allowed for these horrible horrible things to continue and grow worse like I said we're not but about 30 days from hurricane season we're not even close to being out of tornado season yet pertaining to the month of May I just can't believe that so many people have been bamboozled or deceived in not awakening to the facts. Life in and of itself is a learning experience. From the day that you're born, you start out learning. You start out learning how to beg, how to walk, how to crawl, how to cry, how to laugh. How to enjoy life, how to experience life. Life in itself is nothing but a big experience. It's a learning experience. And whenever it gets to the point that you are not concerned about these experiences, but you're only concerned about these experiences, that's whenever things get out of kilter. And that's whenever the man upstairs steps in and says, wait a minute. This is not what I created you for. You're created to have that balance to where not only you treat one another with respect, but you treat God with respect. And whenever you are no longer in that balance, in that rim of balance, then you're considered a misfit. You are considered uh, a heathen. You are considered a being a barbarian. A reprobate. And what did God say that he would do to the reprobate? He said that he would allow for them to believe a lie and to be damned. And that's basically where we are right now in society towards a world full of reprobates that are now making it hard on the rest of us towards seeing all these other occurrences that are occurring regardless whether it comes in the form of a flood, of a fire, of a hurricane, a tornado, or a disease. <clears throat> and until the Christian society wakes up to that and realizes that the main master upstairs is the one that's given us these lessons for a reason and starts teaching others of the same facts, 
incredibly, we're going to see things continue to get worse and worse and worse because God hits things in degrees, the same way that he hit the Pharaohs. He didn't hit the Pharaohs all at once towards destroying the Pharaohs. He brought misery to them in this way, misery to them in this way. He brought uh, locusts, grasshoppers, and then the sea turned red. And then this happened, and that happened, and fire fell from the sky. Um, but they didn't take heed to none of those warnings. And it wasn't until God had to destroy that sector of people to where they realized that they had been defeated. Humanity is not greater than God. No matter how many of us pull together in the same in the same rim. You could pull all seven billion people in the same rim together and you're not going to defeat God. You're not going to defeat the elements. You're not going to defeat the Almighty. And I hope to God that people realize that and they will wake up to why these horrible things continue to keep happening to us again and again and again. Good luck to us. God bless us. And Shalom.